Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2021 Winter CGS Thursday Lecture Series. For those of you who might not know me, I'm Michael Fetters. I'm Professor of Family Medicine over in the med school here at the University of Michigan. I also direct the University of Michigan Mixed Methods Program and the Japanese Family Health Program. And I'm also co-editor in chief of the Journal of Mixed Methods Research. Uh, so it's really uh, exciting to have this talk today. Just as a few general announcements, I wanted to share with you uh, the reminder that there will be no lecture next week, February 4th, but please do join us on Thursday, February 11th for Intimate Disconnections, Divorce, and the Romance of Independence in Contemporary Japan, which is going to be given by our uh, own uh, Allison Alexi, Assistant Professor in the Departments of Asian Languages and Cultures, uh, Women's and Gender Studies, uh, again, here at the University of Michigan. Uh, her lecture will be based upon her new publication, Intimate Disconnections. And our discussant will actually be Ilana Gershon, who is the Ruth N. Halls Professor of Anthropology out at Indiana University. Uh, for all the programs scheduled in the series, please do check out our CGS events page uh, on UM or other sorts of uh, social media that we use. Just as a reminder, the uh, webcams and microphones have been muted, but we do invite you to participate by using the question and answer function during the lecture, as we'd like you to submit any questions you might have, and we'll try and address as many of those as we can after Professor uh, Tajima's presentation. Um, just as a reminder to students that there is still room in the student session at 2 p.m. today, and if you're interested in joining uh, for one-on-one -on -one discussion with Dr. Tajima, who's very engaging, uh, you would need to contact Barbara Kinzer. And I believe that contact information is going to be sent out in the chat to everyone. So without uh, further ado, um, I just would like to say uh, a, a couple of things. Again, a great appreciation to Professor Reggie Jackson for serving as our fabulous director for the Center for Japanese Studies and, uh, and Yuri Fukuzawa and Barbara Kinzer, as well as Robin Griffin, who all helped to make this possible today. So uh, Dr. Tajima is currently a senior visiting scholar in the Michigan Mixed Methods program. She's also an associate professor in the Faculty of Intercultural Studies at Gakushuin Women's College in Tokyo, Japan. Her research interests include intercultural second language communication, evaluation of study abroad programs and mixed methods research. For the past eight years, she's been in charge of a number of study abroad programs for university students at Gakushuin University and responsibilities included administrative and academic activities as well uh, from as much as uh, working with travel agencies, liaison with uh, host universities, working with homestay placements. I mean, she's really done it all. Um, she actually has a uh, interest in intercultural and language education as she studied abroad in the United States uh, where she spent two and a half years in the state of Colorado during her own high school years. She's been doing a number of research about a number of research projects about study abroad. Um, for example, she's uh, doing a project on a disabled student's study abroad experience, which was also funded by the Japan Ministry of Education. Uh, and she has multiple academic papers already published on the top topic. Her first co-edited book was written in Japanese uh, communication known or communication theory. And she uh, authored several, seven chapters actually on intercultural aspects of nonverbal communication, which would be very interesting to read. And uh, she is also the co-author of the textbook Communicate Abroad. Uh, and that is published by Cengage. She's currently actively uh, conducting a project looking at uh, long-term study abroad influences on Japanese medical doctors. Uh, in addition to all this other work she's doing, you'd wonder how she has time. She is passionate and actively promoting the use of mixed methods research in Japan and internationally. She's a board member of the Mixed Methods International Research Association and one of the founding members excuse me, of the Japan Society of Mixed Methods uh, Research. She is uh, currently translating the Mixed Methods Research Workbook, which I'm the author of, 
uh, that's forthcoming in 2021. And she's co-authoring as the lead author an original mixed methods research book called the Mixed Methods Glossary Book, which will be forthcoming in Japanese as well. I think this presentation is gonna be uh, really interesting for everyone who's been able to join us today, both from a content perspective, um, thinking about study abroad in the current context of, of COVID and what it's meant to many of us who have been study abroad students. And also as uh, Dr. Tajima speaks to us about her work uh, and expertise in mixed methods research, given there's a, a lot of growing interest in the social sciences for using mixed methods research. So um, sorry to take so much of your time, Dr. Tajima, but please take it from there. We're very excited to hear what you have to say today. And thank you all for joining. Okay, um, well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Feathers, for a long introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, first thing first, I'd like to thank um, uh, Dr. Reggie Jackson, who is the director of CA uh, uh, Japanese Center for Stud uh, Japanese Center for Japanese Studies, and then also Barbara Kinger, uh, Robin Griffin, and Yuri Fukazawa. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for uh, amazing organization skills um, that you have um, um, done for uh, uh, for me to present today. So thank you so much. Okay, and then finally, I'd like to thank all the participants today who are um, uh, coming to talk, uh, coming to my talk. Okay, so thank you. And so I'm going to um, share my screen uh, now. So let me do this. Okay. Um, okay, so can you see uh, my slide, everyone? Okay. It's perfect. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Um, so um, I'd like to just uh, uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Chihiro Tajima, and I'm senior visiting scholar at Mixed Methods Program uh, at University of Michigan here, and I'm an associate professor of uh, Department of Intercultural Studies uh, at Gakushin Women's College in Tokyo, Japan. Okay, so today I'd like to talk to you about Japanese undergraduate students study abroad for language and cultural learning. Okay. So let me get um, started. Okay, so um, this is an overview of my presentation today. So I will be talking about mainly four points. So first I would like to talk about the trends in study abroad. And next I will talk about the social factors contributing to the content, uh, current trends. And then um, the third, part will be uh, about my research projects that I, uh, I have done, and then finally implications. So let's um, start with um, the trend. Okay, so let me just go this way. Okay, so um, first of all, I'd like to bring your attention to uh, University of Michigan here. So um, number of students from University of Michigan studying abroad outside of the US, uh, I have been amazed by this number here. So uh, University of Michigan is the first in Big Ten University uh, top um, in uh, Big Ten University. And then more surprisingly and amazing, um, fact is that the fourth in the US among all of the public and private universities. So how many uh, actually uh, students are studying abroad? So 3,429 University of Michigan students. So this number includes only the US citizen students. 
um, in 137 countries earning credits in education abroad programs during the 2018 and 2019. So this is the latest um, data that I had access. So, uh, but then if um, we include the non-US citizens as well as um, uh, non-credit education experiences, for example, internship, volunteer projects, uh, research and performances, then 5,640 students, um, University of Michigan students are abroad during 2018 and 2019. And I think um, University of Michigan is doing a great job um, having you know, students uh, experience um, studying abroad. And I, I think it's uh, amazing. So, oops. okay, how about the destination? The top destination of um, University of Michigan students um, studying abroad. So the top three are Spain, UK, and Italy. So um, during 2018 and 2019, 1,405 UM, UM students studied in these three top destinations. And uh, I didn't write it here, but I read about um, University of Michigan uh, medical students uh, going to China, going to Thailand to, um, to study about um, Asian way of treating patients. And I read about them and uh, they're really um, amazing. Um, well, those medical students are having amazing experience uh, abroad. And I was really surprised because usually, you know, because I'm an Asian, I think, you know, people from Asia want to study about how um, things are done in, in medical fields in the West. But um, yeah, it was really nice to see, to read about um, University of Michigan students going to the East to study. Okay, so, um, Next, I'd like to um, talk about um, defining study abroad. So what do I mean by um, study abroad? So study abroad in this study is defined as second or foreign language learners living temporarily in a natural acquisition setting, mainly for the purpose of language learning, cultural interaction and personal and career development. And study abroad learners are those who place themselves in um, study abroad setting after puberty for as long, uh, for as short as few weeks to as long as for a year or more. Okay, so, so here is first uh, question I'm interested in finding out um, how many of you have studied abroad as a student. So um, if you could, Robin, um, put the questions up, then participants, please respond. Okay, so um, so did you all uh, respond? Okay, I think um, I think Robin, maybe um, if you can show us show me the results. Okay. Oh, okay. So half of the people here have done study abroad once, but I'm, uh, yeah, 20% of you have done more than twice. Okay, great. And then, um, okay, so many of you have done study abroad pretty recently. Okay, that's interesting. And then also question number three. If you, if you ever considered study abroad regardless of 
whether you went or not, what potential barriers. Okay, so the money issue is the, um, is the biggest um, issue. And uh, yes, I agree. It is um, very expensive to do study abroad and uh, yeah, so almost 80% of the people here. So that was a burden. Okay, also uh, interrupting other social activities. Uh, yes, and interference with personal relationship, of course. Yes, time issues. Okay, so there are um, issues. Okay, what about Japanese undergraduate students studying abroad? So this is, um, I will be talking about this um, in a minute, but I wanted to ask you what you thought. Okay, right. Hmm. So language issue is 71. Yes. Okay, so that is, yeah, probably you're right. Okay, thank you. Thank you for responding. Okay, so let me close this um, now. So let's move on. Okay, so before um, I start to talk about the um, reasons for um, Japanese students going abroad or not going abroad, I'd like to talk a little bit about the um, number of Japanese undergraduate students going abroad. So the peak was um, 2004 and uh, almost 83,000 uh, undergraduate students went abroad to study. So that was the peak and it has gone down and it picked up a little bit, um, but the trend is, um, it's down, it's, it's decrease in the number of students going abroad. Okay. So let's look at the shifting destination. So, um, okay, so, so 2017 is the la latest data. So I have the latest data here. So the top is the US and, but it has gone down about 10,000. Um, between, between about 10 years, and then um, China. And one difference is Taiwan has come up to third, and the number is more than 8,000 um, from 2000, about um, 12, 13 years ago. And then the rest is similar. So New Zealand has gone uh, out, gone down, and the Brazil appeared uh, in number 10. So there's more um, um, interest in learning a variety of languages um, among Japanese students, undergraduate students. Okay, so let's then, um, I'm going to talk about, start moving <laughs> to the second point, which is social factors contributing to this um, current trend, meaning um, decrease in the number. Uh, of participants. Okay, so um, there are a few uh, factors contributing to this um, decline. So one of the things is shyness. So introversion is used to describe shyness in second language acquisition field. So um, Japanese students are um, shy. And then I have just the two examples here, but I'm sure there are more examples. Uh, one is a study, a comparison study of undergraduate students in seven countries. So US, Australia, Korea, China, the Philippines, Micronesia, and Japan, using this scale of uh, communication anxiety. And Jap Japanese undergraduate students had the highest communication anxiety. So this is in the native language. Um, for Japanese, it's the Japanese language, but still they had the highest, they showed the highest communication anxiety. Okay, so this second one is about uh, second language, uh, well, English speaking. So according to uh, second language acquisition research among, uh, well, among learners, Asian learners, including Japanese learners engaged in less communication in the language classroom. So this is in the second language. Okay, so let's move on to other reasons. So decrease in the number of Japanese students abroad. So these are some of the reasons why it's not possible. So some of you said um, 
Yeah, uh, about 80% of you said that English proficiency could be um, the burden or difficulty, so you're right. So, um, so it's difficult to reach the English proficiency requirements for some students that prevents them to study abroad. Uh, also, um, it the, limits the time for job hunting. And then, of course, many of you guessed correctly, it, uh, prohibitive cost is, uh, is a burden for students to study abroad. Okay, so this next slide shows reasons why study abroad is not so attractive for students. So um, these days, um, many, many people can get lots of information on the internet uh, about life outside of Japan. And then some students have traveled already um, with family, uh, with um, school trips, and then um, this safety concerns is um, an issue. So for example, the shooting rampage on university campuses. And then um, this final two points um, are interesting. So living in Japan is comfortable and don't want to face challenges of study abroad. And some students are soshoku ke, so it's, um, social ke is herbivore type. So I'd like to explain a little bit about these um, last two points here, because they, I think they are uh, interesting characteristics of some of the undergraduate students. Okay, so, um, so university students are sometimes generalized as social kukei or uchimuki shikos, meaning tendency to be content within. Okay, so social care is a non-assertive type person, someone who desire and is um, content with a passive, stress-free, calm, routine-filled lifestyle. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you are um, this way, <laughs> who uh, said have never studied abroad, but this is um, generally for um, Japanese um, young people. Okay. So stereotypically prefers, um, social care people prefer someone else, um, for example, teacher, parent, spouse, um, to assume responsibility for making important decisions on, on his or her behalf. Okay, so um, it's kind of a negative um, way to describe the young um, Japanese people. But um, however, Kuruya, argues that economic situation is the root cause for decreased, decreased motivation among young adults. So, so Uchimiki Shiko is not the cause, but the economic situation is the root cause for them to be uh, Uchimiki Shiko, is his argument. Okay, so um, I've talked about some of the social factors contributing to the current trend. So I'm going to move on to um, my study abroad research that I have conducted next. Okay, first I'd like to just briefly talk about the history of study abroad research. So study abroad research was um, first done by Carol and this was quantitative study. So when I talk about quantitative, that means um, study based on numbers like measure, me measures, surveys, uh, scales. Okay, so Carol conducted a, a pretty big scale um, study um, using, uh, well, uh, participants number was 2,784 American participants and she measured language proficiency and their study abroad experience. And then and the other important uh, study was by Schumann and Schumann in 1977. This was the qualitative. So when I say qualitative, that's um, non-number data, like interview data, observation data, um, mostly. Uh, well, interview data, mostly. Okay, so this was a diary studies of researchers themselves. So they are a married couple and they um, did the narrative accounts of unsuccessful, very difficult learning experience. And this study was significant because it revealed the importance of qualitative study and social psychology to language learning. 
Okay, so just a, a little bit more brief overview. So then since 1980s, may, uh, many study abroad research studies were conducted, but they were um, mostly using two different approaches. Um, so quantitative based or qualitative based, and they have been kept separate. So quantitative studies measuring gains by pre-post designs and qualitative studies have examined the process and experience of um, students' adaptation to living abroad. So um, there's a need for more investigations using both quantitative and qualitative data in one single study. So I feel this need. And then so I have always um, been um, doing study abroad research, um, incorporating and integrating quantitative and qualitative data within a study. So uh, I'm going to show you uh, my, uh, my studies uh, of, well, we call it mixed methods. So because we um, integrate quantitative and qualitative data into uh, in one single study. So I'm going to show you a mixed methods study abroad research that I have conducted. Um, okay, uh, before I do that, um, so, uh, in study abroad research, uh, we investigate in four, mainly four areas. Um, so they are language learning, uh, intercultural competence, social and emotional growth and disciplinary uh, knowledge. So we think that um, study abroad outcomes fall into one of those or many of those um, areas. So, um, but then of course there are uh, moderators. So the outcomes depend on the individual differences and the program and host culture. Okay, and uh, also I'd like to talk about um, these um, domains or constructs um, that I'm going to use in my studies. I use them because they're they are important for Japanese um, context, well, Japanese, for Japanese students. So first of all, uh, the first domain is motivation, um, motivation for communication, motivation for learning um, English is difficult for Japanese students because Japan is a homogeneous society and students really don't really need to study English to live and there's not uh, many uh, opportunities for the Japanese students to engage themselves in natural um, English communication in Japan. So there's a motivation issue to study English. So um, I use motivation scale to uh, measure motivation. Okay, and then also willingness to communicate is um, uh, another um, area or another uh, domain, which is um, really important for Japanese students, but difficult. So as um, many of you may know, Japan is a high context culture. So high context culture means uh, we depend on the context, background knowledge to communicate. So in Japan, silence is valued um, sometimes and we don't say everything, um, how we feel or what we are thinking. Um, so we kind of um, depend on the context for other people to understand, or we try to understand the other people, the other people using the context rather than uh, saying everything. So this willingness to communicate, which is, uh, well, the low context culture is um, character so, you know, one of the characteristics of English speaking countries. And so it's, it's difficult for Japanese students to have to explain everything verbally. So, so this is one um, domain. And the other domain is language anxiety. I just want to explain a little bit about how, why this is important issue. So um, in Japan, English education um, is basically uh, aiming for high school entrance exam and university entrance exam. And so the examinations um, are all usually paper tests. So there's a lot of focus on accuracy. So um, as educators, we want the students to have accuracy as well as fluency but because of this pressure for the entrance examination um, to pass 
English test, uh, the um, education is English education usually focus on accuracy. So uh, students um, have uh, many students have language anxiety that they are worried about making mistakes and they don't want to make mistakes. I feel that way too, a lot. <laughs> okay, so uh, my research question then um, is what is the measurable impact and perspectives of Japanese undergraduate students linguistic and affective factors studying abroad? So I'm go going to compare students going to Canada and students going to the Philippines. Um, so I'm going to compare the outcomes and the experience of those um, students going to different destinations using qualitative, qualitative mixed methods research. Okay, so uh, first I'd like to uh, explain a little bit to you about the context of the um, Canada um, study abroad and Canada study that I did. Okay, so um, for Canada study, um, as I kind of, uh, as I explained in the previous slide, I'm, um, I'm going to focus on a proficiency and then motivation, willingness to communicate and language anxiety. So I have already um, published one paper on uh, of quantitative study, just a number of data already. And I've uh, published um, mixed methods case study paper, which is um, qualitatively driven. Okay, so that's, um, that's already there. Okay, and just like to um, explain about the program because the outcome depends on the program. Um, so, and then the individual differences. Okay, so the participants are 29 female learners and they are first to third year university students in Tokyo and the level of proficiency is elementary to intermediate. So this, what I'm doing is that I'm taking a traditional study abroad destination where English is the main language used in society rather than lingua franca, which I'm going to tell you about um, later in the, the study abroad in the Philippines. Okay, so I'm still talking about Canada study abroad program. So um, it's um, in British Columbia, and then also students went to um, university in, in Alberta. So um, the classroom instruction only for four to five times a week, six hours of classroom English, and the home stay for four weeks. So this is the difference the, the, between the um, Canada study and the Philippine study. I will tell you uh, about Philippine studies in a minute, but the Canada studies, classroom instruction and homestay. And sightseeing and visiting um, cultural tours, really nice uh, places. Okay, so I'm going to bring your attention to the Philippines um, study abroad. Um, I'm saying proficiency uh, measure and then also motivation, willingness to communicate and language anxiety. And so this is the English as a lingua franca environment where English is used as a tool for communication, um, but speakers may not be the native speakers of English. Okay, so I've um, already published the uh, mixed methods study um, talking both about quantitative and qualitative data together um, in 2018. So um, this is uh, about Philippine program. Okay, so 21 female learners, uh, saying first uh, third year university students in Tokyo and the similar uh, learners of uh, levels of English. And the reason for choosing for Philippine program is it's much economical. Um, so students who do not have enough money go to um, well, tend to choose um, Philippine program. And some students are not confident enough to do homestay in English speaking country, that's very intense. So, um, so that's another reason for choosing the Philippine program. And then um, some of them really like to have one-to-one -one instruction. So this is one of the um, uh, benefits of going to Philippine study is to, getting, to get one-to-one -one instruction. 
Okay, so this study abroad program is uh, in the city uh, called Bacold. It's one hour um, uh, um, from Manila. So it's a dormitory stay right next to school and lots of international students, uh, mainly Korean students and two students per room, but um, it's curfew every day. So they're not free to go out uh, except for Wednesdays and um, weekends. They have to go out with their teachers on Wednesdays for safety. And they can go out on when weekdays during the uh, daytime. Okay, and then activities include trips to nice beaches and but also um, visiting orphanage, etc. for their um, for their learning. So this is really the Linga Franca environment that I'm comparing with Canada study, Canada study abroad. So just uh, uh, research um, about research though. Um, so I collected pre and post quantitative um, data on language test and then also affective domains. So motivation, willingness to communicate and language anxiety measures. And then uh, qualitatively, I've collected data um, pre study abroad and post study abroad. Um, semi-structured interview. Semi-structured means um, trying to get, um, trying to make sure I get, um, I ask the questions that I want to ask. So, um, so meaning I match the questions um, that, that I've asked in quantitative uh, surveys, so motivation, willingness to communicate and language anxiety. So I've asked about them in the semi-structured interview, but it's semi-structured. So there's room for students to talk freely about their experience so that I can learn from them uh, something that I haven't really thought about. So, okay, so um, let me, uh, let's go to the next slide. So the purpose of the comparison project is to clarify the differences of study abroad outcomes in two destinations using a mixed method research design and integration of quant and qual findings. Okay, so here is uh, another question that I would like to ask you to just uh, get you um, thinking about my study. So for each of the following, what, which do you think, which do you think the quantitative survey results were similar between students in Canada or the Philippines? So, so comparing, um, comparing Canada and the Philippine studies, do you think they are similar? Which ones were similar in terms of results? So English proficiency, so the language gain was similar or willingness to communicate was similar. The decrease of anxiety was similar or motivation, um, development of motivation was similar. So what, what would you choose? Or you can choose all if you think, if you think they are the same. Okay, all right. Hmm. So only 30% of you thought proficiency would be similar in, in um, you know, uh, gain, willingness to communicate, anxiety, and motivation. Okay, right. Okay, so let's, <laughs> let's look, let's move on. Okay, it's kind of difficult to, um, to um, guess, I think. Okay, so let's move on. Oops. Okay, so um, yeah, so from here, I'm going to compare um, the two studies that I have already published each, then clarify the differences in outcomes and learning experiences. 
Okay, so um, this is really just to um, let you know um, that um, the analyzing is this way. So I've um, compared quantitative data uh, of, of the Philippine study and Canada study, and then the qualitative data uh, of um, Philippine study and Canada study. Okay. So, so another poll question. Okay, so which one of the following do you think best describes the student's gain in English proficiency? So higher gain in English proficiency in the Philippines. So just start, you know, asking you further what you think about the results. So this is about English, English proficiency. So higher gain in English proficiency in Canada or no clear differences in gain in English proficiency. Okay, maybe I think, is it ready? Okay, so um, more of you think higher gain in English proficiency in Canada. Okay, interesting. And then 24% um, of you think there's no clear difference. Okay, All right, so let's find out. Okay, so um, just a you know, research question is here. Do learners make gains in English proficiency after studying abroad in the lingua franca environment and in Canada for five weeks? And uh, I've also um, kind of put everything together because of the time constraints. Um, also, I'm going to show you the results for the um, improvements of Willingness to communicate language anxiety and motivation after studying abroad in these two different destinations. So here is the results. It's a little bit difficult to see, but I've uh, put in the uh, mean scores. So Canada, um, so there's um, average is has gone up. And then for the Philippines study, the average has gone up. And then, so the proficiency, um, students were able to make um, significant proficiency gain in both destinations. And then surprisingly, motivation also uh, gain in both destinations and willingness to communicate um, yes, in both destinations, students made gain. And then language anxiety went down in both destinations. So actually for, sh this is short-term study abroad. So it's a four week program. So as short as four weeks, um, students were able to make gains in um, language and uh, proficiency as well as these um, non-linguistic, but very connect, uh, connected to, uh, closely connected to English proficiency. So these affective factors improved in a month. Okay, so I have an interpretation here. So regardless of destination, participants make gains in English proficiency and improved affect the factors. Okay, so, um, well, this is mixed methods um, research. So I'm going to show you the uh, interview data between uh, um, the two destinations. So here is, I think this is the last question for you. So what do you think? Were there differences in interview data between the two destinations? So no clear uh, differences or some differences? So in interview, um, I'm basically asking about, you know, motivation, willingness to communicate language, anxiety, so that the questions were matched to um, surveys. Okay, right, right. Okay, so yes. So many of you think 
the quantitative data results were very similar, actually. So in both destinations, students made gain in all areas. Um, but for um, um, interview data reveal some differences. Okay, so let's um, let's look. Okay, so qualitative research question was what explanation can be drawn concerning proficiency gain and increase of affect from interview data of Philippine and Canada study abroad programs. Okay, um, here I like to introduce just one uh, mixed methods term here and then also uh, um, a strategy that we use in mixed methods to really try to uh, compare quantitative and qualitative data. So um, it's called joint display in mixed methods research. So it is a table of figure that represents with structural features in a side by side or other type of juxtaposed representation, um, the qualitative and quantitative data collection procedures or findings. So here I'm do, using a table and then I'm showing you the findings. Okay, so this is a little bit busy, this table, but uh, let me just show you this table. So I'm going to show you a series of tables like, like this. And so I'm just going to show you now. So the left column has the quantitative data results, actually the results. So first one is the proficiency test results. So for example, for this is proficiency, the results of paired samples t-test show the participants on average achieved um, higher proficiency. Okay, so well, I already showed you the summary, so I'm not going to read um, everything uh, anymore because the table showed the summary already. So then the, um, the second column shows the typical interview responses. Um, for example, here is about proficiency test results. So one student says, my English improved. I couldn't think of what to say before, but I had to speak even if I didn't want to. So I'm able to speak much more than before. So, so this is um, Canada, uh, study abroad Canada. Um, study. Okay, so um, another quote here, to improve English, it's important to talk to my host family. Okay, uh, another typical uh, response is I feel happy when I can communicate with foreigners, so I want to study and improve my English. So they are all um, um, positive um, attitudes about English, um, improving, trying to improve English. So the interpretation is on the right column, interpreting um, both quantitative and qualitative data. So speaking to the host family seems to contribute to the um, gains in English proficiency and also positive attitudes towards English may have contributed to uh, proficiency gain. Okay, so, um, Right, so maybe I have a lot, but uh, maybe I will not read all of it. This, so this is uh, um, on motivation, domain is motivation. And then the typical responses, uh, I want to study abroad again. Uh, I want to be in an environment where I could speak English. Um, I want to work in the hospitality industry. So um, I will, uh, there will be foreign customers. I want to communicate with their various people, etc. So interpretation is the um, uh, it's motivation to speak English and communicate in English, um, and some some are eager to study abroad again. So um, Canada responses are very. Um, what do you call it? Um, nothing, not, not so special. They are all in the positive experiences that students had. So uh, willingness to communicate is, um, okay. I don't know if my communication skills are higher, but I can, oh, maybe I should read from here. Even in Japan, in Japanese, if I need to search something, I searched it myself. Now I don't know if my communication skills are higher, but I ask other people to help me. 
Okay, right. So uh, more willingness to communicate more willingness, more willing to initiate conversation after studying abroad, more confident and positive about communicating in English. So um, yeah, this student says, I'm just a bit more cheerful, cheerful now. I feel like I'm letting my feelings come out. I want to express them more openly, etc. I can't read the, uh, the thing here, but uh, yeah. So, Okay, right, so that's willingness to communicate. So anxiety, um, similar. So for example, when foreigners are lost in Japan, I was asked for directions, but I really couldn't understand. So I said, sorry, and I ran away. I used to have an image of foreigners, so that's scary, but I feel like I can initiate conversation now. Or I am so shy, I can't speak, I can't speak loud, my voice becomes shaky and I speak so fast, but I am able to speak better now and I feel good. So learners want to were less anxious to speak, but did not give reasons for this change for Canada group. Okay, so um now, um, as I said before, uh, I did, I conducted semi-structured interviews. So some, um, I was able to ask um, more openly, you know, students were able to um, talk more freely about their experience. So just uh, for Canada, um, key additional qualitative findings is that regardless of proficiency levels, there was limited improvement of cultural awareness, but some, uh, sojourners elaborated their impressions with example after study abroad. Uh, for example, foreigners are not indecisive, so we need to decide yes or no. So I try to reply quickly. If I am indecisive, I might make them annoyed. So uh, because in Japan, people are very uh, vague in their responses. But um, in English, we have to say yes, no quickly, I think. Okay, so intercultural awareness is how people become aware of other ways of thinking, living, or behaving, and how they perceive their experience with others. So um, really for a Canada group, the um, important improvement was language learning and then uh, affective factors that um, accompany the language learning. And then not, um, um, very limited improvement of cultural awareness. Okay, so for uh, one of the characteristics of a Canada um, study abroad program for one month is that there's uh, language gain, uh, but uh, not so much in other areas. Okay, so um, just uh, um, talking about now the Philippine. Um, study. So the Philippine study is um, the qualitative data are um, very different. Well, different. So I think many of you uh, guessed right. The quantitative data are similar, but qualitative um, data really illustrated um, the important differences of the two destinations. So so um, this typical response. So I studied really hard every day. I spoke a lot of English with Koreans in the dorm. So this is about uh, English proficiency gain. So, um, so interpretation here is the gains in proficiency were not solely due to one-to-one -to -one English instruction. So students engaged in using and studying and speaking, reading, etc., and feedback uh, received during one-to-one -one session was really important. Okay, so um, this is motivation, domain of motivation. So let's just read some of the typical uh, interview response. So the best part of the trip was my one-to-one -one lessons. It was so much fun. The teacher's, teacher was friendly, so we talked about many things. Teachers spoke Tagalog as their native language, but they were all educated to use English as a second language. Teachers had studied English very hard. 
So not just teachers, but many people on the island were bilinguals. Many people were um, good in English on this island. So interpretation here is the qualitative responses show why they were motivated, seeing the Filipino instructors as bilinguals motivated students. And many Filipinos studied English uh, and they were bilinguals and that really surprised the students. Okay, so here is willingness to communicate. Um, yeah, so similar, um, uh, um, let, let me just read one. So I'm not, I'm used to people starting conversations with me in English at shop, I'm not surprised and I can just talk. So, um, and then this one says, since there were a lot of one-to-one -one lessons, I began to speak a lot. So having more opportunities to speak in English in authentic, authentic communications uh, with non-native speakers of English made them less confident and uh, concerned about mistakes. Okay, so here is um, anxiety. Um, so my one-to-one -one teacher tried hard to understand my English, so I wasn't nervous anymore. My teacher worked on my pronunciation a lot. Everyone on the street was so friendly there. In Japan, I hated speaking in English. I hated talking to non-Japanese, but I got used to it and really had fun. So the interpretation here is the increase in learner anxiety was largely due to one-to-one -one lessons. Students were highly engaged and had fun in the Philippines. Okay, so um, key additional qualitative findings, um, as I said, uh, uh, um, semi-structured interview allowed me or allowed students to talk about um, their experience freely. So here, um, language learning, uh, well, students, uh, students were going to the Philippines expected less, so resulted in higher study abroad satisfaction so um, before going to the Philippines, I interviewed all of them and they were so worried about um, things like, it's not so nice, but um, um, bugs like roaches or the um, toilets in the dormitory, they were told that they're not supposed to flush the toilet uh, tissues, but they're supposed to just put it in the basket in their room. So they were concerned about um, uh, those kind of issues that are um, very different from Japan. So um, this kind of um, worries before going um, kind of resulted in higher study abroad satisfaction. Okay, so and social and emotional growth was apparent. So students visit, visited an orphanage twice. A child who was fine on the first visit was very sick the second visit. Uh, almost dying. And uh, so one student talked about the need to appreciate her everyday life more in Japan. So many students talk, talked about um, this realization of um, different, very different world existing outside of Japan that they really didn't know anything about. And that really uh, made them um, become aware of what, um, what, they have in Japan and uh, yeah, and uh, this was many students talked about this aspect of the study abroad. So the so from the Philippines program, um, I think the, the outcomes were apparent in language learning and then also social and emotional growth can uh, could be uh, observed. Okay, um, so the implications, I'm coming to almost an uh, end to my talk. Um, so it's almost over, <laughs> okay. So uh, the final implications. So um, for both Canada and the Philippines, by comparing them, there was no substantive differences between the two study uh, environments based on quantitative data. Uh, and the qualitative data showed, qual uh, quant Okay, so quantitative, sorry, quantitative data showed improvements in English proficiency and affective factors. They are willingness to communicate motivation and anxiety in both traditional and lingua franca environment. 
Okay, and then qualitative sh uh, data showed differences. So st students in Philippines made gains in all domains of affective factors due to one-to-one -one instruction and being in a lingua franca environment. Okay, and then students in Canada made gains in do all domains by a drastic increase in using English. So the value added here for mixed methods research is that um, if I was just doing the quantitative um, empirical study, I couldn't have uh, under understood the, um, the real differences between the um, study abroad in two um, um, different um, destinations. So it's, it's, it's very useful to have quantitative and qualitative data within the study. Okay, and then I just like to talk a little bit about, uh, well, um, touch on future study abroad projects. So as um, Dr. Feathers um, touched on this uh, at the introduction, I am right now doing long-term influence um, study of study, uh, study abroad experience uh, of students. As we all know that uh, because of the COVID pandemics, there's no students, not many students abroad right now. So I'm looking at medical doctors who studied abroad in the past and then um, uh, conducting a research on how, um, how that experience influenced them as uh, medical doctors uh, in terms of resilience, uh, humility, empathy, et cetera. And then also, um, this out, uh, outcomes of online study abroad programs is another um, another emerging um, uh, aspect of study abroad program. For example, at my university in Tokyo, students are right now currently doing six months online study abroad because they need credits to um, study abroad credits to graduate. So. Um, so they're doing online programs, but um, study abroad definition, one of the definitions is that um, you, the students need to be in the natural acquisition setting. So we might have to change the definition a little bit uh, in the future, but uh, hopefully the pandemic will um, come to um, an end soon. And then the uh, normal study abroad will resume. Okay, I just like to um, uh, summarize today's presentation. Um, so at first I talked about study abroad trends. I talked about University of Michigan being fourth in the US and also decrease in the number of study abroad students, uh, Japanese undergraduate students. And then I, um, okay. And then uh, secondly, I talked about social factors contributing to the uh, current trends. Uh, such as introverted shyness, social k, a herbivore, or utsumuki shiko, a content within type people, type um, young people, and cost of time and money and internet access, etc., contributing to the uh, factors of um, yeah to the factor. Okay, and then thirdly, I talked about my study abroad mixed methods research. So students in both Canada and the Philippines had similar measurable gains, but interview data provided different pictures in each destination. So language gain as well as social and emotional growth was apparent in the Philippine group, but uh, for Canada group, it was mostly limited to language gain. Okay, and then the implications I uh, talked about study abroad destination as a study abroad destination. Philippines is a good study abroad destination for students with elementary English proficiency levels. And also uh, for students, uh, a, a lingua franca environment is suitable for Japanese learners of English with language anxiety and motivation and willingness to communicate um, issues. Okay, so um, yeah, finally, I'd just like to say that this work was supported by the Ministry of Education, um, and I really appreciate them for supporting my research. So then I have the references here, and I'm sure the, uh, the PowerPoint is available for you later. So thank you again for uh, listening to my talk. 
and I'll stop here. Thank you. Stop sharing the screen. Well, very good. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tajima. And I would encourage all of our participants to consider submitting either content-based questions or methodological questions because we really have the um, great pleasure of having an expert in both of those areas. So um, I'm actually going to start with um, a first question here. Sorry, I have to go through some screens here. Um, the question is uh, uh, submitted by uh, Robin, who actually said, um, how do Japanese schools or universities and the teachers there view this declining trend in the interest in study abroad? And um, what are the efforts to increase the number of students uh, to do more study abroad? You know, on even you know even at a single country level or on a country by country basis. So that was a number of questions there. Um, so what are the teachers thinking about this? Universities thinking about that, and what efforts are being made to increase the number of students studying abroad, as well as um, are there specific initiatives by country? Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for the question. Um, well, first, I think overall, um, what uh, Ministry of Education has provided this uh, funds for students a um, huge amount of money to support study abroad. So first, uh, first, the Ministry of Education um, provided funds for medium length or uh, long term study abroad up to a year but they didn't have enough applicant to, um, to, to give the money to. So they decided to change to short-term study abroad, supporting short-term study abroad. So the, uh, I didn't talk about this in the talk, but um, the, the, there's an increase of short-term study abroad, which is uh, from about two weeks to um, eight weeks. So that's uh, on the increase. So, um, Ministry of Education is supporting now short-term study abroad and uh, providing 80,000 yen, which is about almost $800 per student. So um, institutions, universities need to write applications um, for students, so program by program. So I have done that uh, uh, for many students and for my programs as well. So that's one of the ways that um, to promote study abroad in general. And uh, so the first question was the Japanese schools and universities and teachers um, view the decline trends in study abroad. Um, it's, uh, it's really difficult because it concerns the money we want students to go and the students want to go, but um, it's the cost issue is, um, is huge. So we can't just encourage them to go because there's, you know, the students actually need to have money to go. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult, um, I think it's a difficult situation, but my university in Tokyo, we, sub, we have funds for students uh, to help students study abroad. So we do encourage, I guess, same as um, uh, Ministry of Education, uh, but we, uh, university bases, provide um, scholarship and funds, lots of scholarship and fund for students to apply so that it makes it easier um, for students to go abroad. So that's, um, yeah, we think it's difficult, but money issues really difficult, so we support in that way. So just out of curiosity then, Dr. Yeah. Kajima, is there a sense that um, universities or the uh, national government is taking into consideration some of your findings to look not just at the uh, issue of cost, but mm -hmm. some of the other issues that you mentioned? Is there some sense that, you know, the, so the cost one seems fairly straightforward, but you really mm -hmm. enumerated on a number of factors. Uh, you know, we don't really know a weighting of those things, but has there been any uh, interest or efforts to uh, bring more focus to some of the other issues that you mentioned? Um, yes, um, 
Okay, so I think one of the things that we try to do, it's a little bit dif different than um, sending students abroad, but we try to um, internationalize the campus so that students have access to or um, have more opportunities to speak to students um, from other countries. So that is one of the other um, push from um, the government to fund um, taking uh, students from overseas to uh, internationalize the campus. So that's that's another way to, well, I'm, you know, this is not about um, student, um, Japanese students going overseas, but uh, that's, that's another way to kind of um, have an international, intercultural right. uh, communication um, on campus. And that's interesting because in some ways it could make the Japanese setting more comfortable because you mm -hmm. could talk to a foreigner without leaving campus <laughs> Yes. Um, or perhaps it could motivate them. So maybe there's a whole nother mm -hmm. area of research there to see how that's um, working out. So, um, mm -hmm. so we had another question. It's a little bit uh, different question. And then I've got a question I would like to come back to and I uh, would encourage our participants if they have other, other questions to submit them. A question was submitted by uh, Raymond Tran. Would the high school entrance exam mm -hmm. be similar to the United States standard academic test, so the SAT? Could you comment a little bit on how the, um, uh, the testing occurs for entrance into university and perhaps comment if you think that has um, influence thinking about study abroad too. Just, you know, this focus on the entrance exam, how is it different between US and Japan and then, uh, or similar? And do you think it has any impact on study abroad motivations? Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, so SAT is a standardized test. So for um, Japanese universities, there is a standardized test that takes place in January. So, um, English is really important part of the standard, but that um, entrance exam that takes place um, all of all over Japan on those two days. Um, so it's it's a very um, so that is all paper test um, English test and then listening and then the uh, writing, uh, well not writing but multiple choice question. So that is a really a heavy focus on accuracy on um, on English. So yeah, and then so that's well that's the uh, standardized test, and then there's also also um, university original test that each university administers maybe three times, four times a year, and so that's all a paper test based. And then also there's this admission office self-recommendation entrance to most of the universities. That um, is unique because um, students can have um, study abroad experience in high school and that can be a strength to enter um, university. So <laughs> one of the other trends is the study abroad becoming um, more targeted for younger people so that maybe the undergraduate students going overseas is on the decrease because they have already done study abroad in high school and uh, or have access to going abroad in high school or younger. Uh, I did talk about that a little bit, um, but yeah, so English is really important part of the entrance exam for high school and the university definitely and then one way uh, to yeah people with money can send um, families with money can send high school students abroad and then those students have access to admissions office entry enter into university so very interesting sounds like a, a more complex situation potentially for, for Japanese students. I wanted to go back to your mention of the increasing number of the short-term stays mm -hmm. um, because you know from the poll question that you asked, a number of respondents said that they had more than one study abroad experience. And mm -hmm. so 
it yes. might suggest the question does a initial short term stay, you know, two to four weeks like the students in your study. Is that an effective way to get more students to participate in longer term studies, you know, given the uh, Ministry of Education's effort to support this and then not getting enough applicants. Does the short term uh, sort of short stay lead to uh, longer term stays? Is there any data out on that? Has anyone looked at whether that's maybe a way to entice students to study abroad more? Yeah, I, yeah I, that's a really good question. Uh, thank you. I don't really have a data on that, but it's just my gut feeling um, by talking to students doing um, study abroad research that short term, like short term study abroad does lead to um, more study abroad um, experiences but short term is is nice because students can do it during summer or during the winter vacation time mm. but um so what they do is to go to multiple short-term study abroad if they have enough money um, but then if they want to go for longer study abroad then um, it really interferes with their um uh, academic curriculum or job hunting so they do want to do short term and then long term but um, sometimes um, it's too late that they do short term in the second year and then it's kind of too late to prepare for long term because then um, they have to come back for job hunting um, after third year in Japan. So is the, so, um, the lack of uh, credit for study abroad become a barrier? So if students are on track for a four-year graduation and they say, okay, well, I'm going to go do, say, six months in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the U.S., uh, does that then cause them to graduate later? Does the, does the university actually give them credit for that time that they're studying yeah. abroad? And, and so if that's true, how does that then interfere with their their graduation yeah thank you so that's very technical but um so for example students take like uh, 20 credits um in new zealand but if they take many language courses because their english level is not that high so they have half academic um undergrad courses and then they have um extra language courses then they will not get uh, credits for all of the language uh, courses because they've probably filled those language um, credits already before going to New Zealand, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, depending on the students, you know, English proficiency level or the courses they take, you know, the uh, compatibility of the credits and the courses on the syllabus based on the syllabus it's kind of complicated to we want to give more credits but uh, if they're only taking classes that I cannot uh, bring back or they have already taken then it's, it's they lose some credits so that's very that's a very interesting response and it actually leads to a question posed by uh yuri fukazawa she asked what could u.s universities do to attract study abroad students from Japan. So you've made it clear already that financial support is important, but um, are there other things? Um, so for example, um, should we be offering our study abroad students credits outside of English credits? You know, would that help them, you know, towards their majors? So should US universities be more cognizant about offering not just English credits, but other kinds of credits as well? Could that make a difference? Or are there other things that uh, U.S. universities could do to attract, you know, some of these brightest students from Japan. Yeah, I think that it's it, it's really exciting for um, Japanese students, but I think it has to kind of be tailored to um, groups of students. Maybe some um, some language uh, support as well as content um, courses. Um, so if students are measuring in hospitality, then um, some language courses as well as um, content courses, um, so put together. Um, so it's, it's a lot of, probably a lot of work, but um, tailoring to the needs of the group of students or the group of um, universities, then I think packaging um, 
like that, I'm medical students or the uh, business majors. So having you know both content and as you said, is probably um, needed <laughs> needed for students to participate. Right. So um, I'm torn here between a question I want to ask, um, but I'm going to ask the one posed. Um, uh, uh, well, there's, oh boy, now the question's really going, coming in. Um, uh, so uh, our director, our, our, uh, Professor Reggie Jackson asks, uh, what is your sense of the government's attitude towards study abroad? So beyond final financial expenses, do you think that uh, the government considers it more of a luxury or, and therefore it's less of a priority? So is study abroad, you know, a luxury? Uh, what do you think the government's sense of value of study abroad is? And is there something that maybe has changed since 2004? Um, I think the government is really, really uh, pushing study abroad still and uh, um, lots of um, attention going to, for example, double de degree programs and as well as um, short-term study abroad uh, fund that I was talking to you about. So, you know, more serious, um, you know, double degree programs, uh, longer study abroad uh, exchanges, as well as um, um, really short programs. So what they are saying is that English, as well as intercultural communication should be, should be um, uh, acquired by study abroad. Mm -hmm. And that is those two um, are what they are hoping for, for students to get out of uh, study abroad. And they really specifically say English and intercultural communication skills are really important for the uh, people, you know, for the young people of Japan for the future. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, they are, they are um, pushing, but um, I think for double degree program, for example, we do have a uh, university double degree program, but it's very difficult for students time-wise and money-wise to do double degree. So it's not so been used so much. Uh, we do have a lot of scholarship for that, those students, but um, it's not been used so much. Just uh, that language proficiency barrier for really um, serious study abroad program is very high for Japanese people. Yeah, so, so actually I can kind of weave in one final question. Um, and it's kind of a combination of a question between uh, Robin and myself. So uh, Robin Griffin asked about um, your sense as to uh, how students are responding to the online format. I know you mentioned that that's gonna be, you know, part of your research. And then I'm gonna tag my last question to that, the one I have a burning desire to ha hear you answer is, how do you counsel students uh, now thinking about online formats and also choosing between say going to the Philippines or Canada, UK, you know, one of those countries, you know, you're in a position, you're a director of these programs. How do you counsel students uh, about, you know, where to go and also thinking about, you know, how does this online format affect that? And are you seeing any similarities with online formats, say with, are there online formats with the Philippines or online formats, you know, in lingua franca, as well as native only, you know, uh, monolinguistic environments. So I gave you a long, complicated question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, in terms of online study abroad, it's just started and it's just been a struggle. I think I'm, on, actually I'm on, a sabbatical this year so I'm not overseeing the program so I um, I kind of uh, I'm not with the online study abroad um, very much I will be when I go back to Japan so um, yeah I think it's just a whole new um, new world of um, online everything and uh, yeah it will be an interesting um, and difficult challenges uh, for students but I'm I'm, you know, before doing the Philippine study abroad um, research, I was kind of skeptical about um, 
study abroad in lingua franca environment, but I found out so many good things about studying abroad in lingua franca environment. So I'm you know, excited to um, see what students uh, will be experiencing and uh, they are already doing. So what they thought about the online study abroad, I'm really interested in learning and really um, doing research on what, what um, the outcomes are. And then uh, in terms of choosing destinations, um, there's a staff office, an office with staffs who are experienced um, to listen to students' um, um, preferences. So I do like to have a lot of say, but basically students choose what they want to do in terms of um, programs and destinations, and we kind of support what they want to do. So as long as they're not social cliquet, right? <laughs> then, then they'll <laughs> yes. choose if they're not social cliquet. Well, this is truly fabulous. Uh, we really appreciate your time. It's giving us insights both into the cultural aspects of study abroad, but also uh, presenting to our uh, participants today some of the latest cutting edge mixed, mixed methods research methodology that you're using in your social science uh, research. So. I guess, uh, I think at this point, we usually do a, a virtual round of applause. I'll try and amplify everyone else's applause. And if you can send your applauses through the, uh, the chat box uh, so that we can express our uh, appreciation to Dr. Tajima. And again, all of our supporters today, a reminder again, uh, I believe there are still slots if you want to uh, speak to uh, Dr. Tajima in a more one-on-one -on -one situation. You can see she has lots of background and understanding about uh, a variety of things methodologically as well as uh, social culturally. Uh, I believe we need to have a, uh, there's going to be a switch now, Robin, if I understand correctly, uh, to uh, the screen share. And um, I think on that front, we just want to make sure to remind you to join us for our, our next lecture by uh, our own uh, Professor Allison Alexi. And who and we'll have the discussant by Ilana uh, Gershon from uh, Anthropology at Indiana U University. So once again, thank you all. Um, hope you um, had a stimulated, uh, stimulating afternoon as I did, and we'll look forward to hearing from uh, all of you in future talks. <laughs>